to the fore. My father uh, felt that George was too simple a name for himself. So he changed his name. My father, the first time he got some money that belonged to him is when he went to the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CC camps, they called them. And when he came back, he bought himself two new suits of clothes and hired a lawyer and had him to add a middle name, which was Chermopoli, C-H-E-R-O-M-O-P-E-L-E-S. So he became George Chermopoli Benjamin. And he made me play doll because he said that in case I turn out to be a unique person, I would have a fitting name. That's how I got it. In the 18th century, you could stand on this balcony and see both rivers and see the whole island of Manhattan. So in the Battle of Harlem Heights during the American Revolution, this is where George Washington made his headquarters. Now in this house, you can see the way the white folks lived, who had money, and you can see the way the slaves lived, because they have the kitchen and what have you down here. Uh, I wanted to start here because this is where the American nation began. And when it began, we were slaves. Now, I'm going to talk about what has happened in the last couple of hundred years and how we came from slavery to where we are now and the role that education has played in that leadership. I'm going over to the uh, Eagle Academy. Speak to a group of young black men with their head on straight. Uh, achievers, you know, who are on their way to positions of leadership. So this was the site of our degradation. Now we're going to a site of our triumph. How do you find, uh, what, what's the main problem you have with the young men here? Uh, I think a lot of it centers around identity. I think, I, think, I, think, I think the crisis that we're experiencing in our society is really an identity crisis. And uh, boys of color, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm painting with broad strokes to a certain extent. Yeah, but but, 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 yeah. but I, I think a lot of our young men aren't as comfortable with their identity as a learner, or their identity as a scholar, right? Because that's not what they see. They're not it's not what they see as much. It's not as cool. It's not as, you know. And, you know, as you're walking to school and walking through different neighborhoods, you have to put on this tough exterior, you know. Well, see, one of the reasons, speaking about today, for instance, when you ask me about whether I always wear a hat, which, which, no, I don't, you know, and at times when I make speeches and when it depends upon, you know, where I am, you know, if I'm in a in university setting or term, whatever, you know, I just, you know, basically do what I want. But with these young men, you see, one of the... Uh, uh, problems with with young uh, minority men when he's talking about them having difficulty uh, imaging themselves or imagining themselves as scholars. Uh, part of it is because they think that to be smart is to be a square, you know, and everybody want to be hip. Well, they can take one look at me and see I ain't a square, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and yet, you know, uh, I'm as big a bookworm as they're likely to ever meet. Yeah. First of all, since I knew I was coming to talk to a group of young bloods, I decided I would come dressed the way I always dress so y'all can see what old school cool is, because I know y'all <laughs> I can tell that by the way I see y'all going to take girls out with, with, with sports jerseys on, right? If I was a girl, I wouldn't go to the carnival with no guy who showed up uh, with, a, with his favorite athlete jersey on. You know what I'm saying? This is the way we used to dress. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, in the, hip hop didn't come out of nowhere. I know y'all think it did, right? But it didn't. Uh, when I was coming up, uh, we used to recite rhymes like this. I was born in a barrel of butcher knives. They were started down 45. I eat the meat, bird, bone, and run a chump out his home. I eat the bone and bury me, run his boys down, homeboys down the street. Brahma bulls and charge me, never pierce my hide. Cold mm -hmm. snakes and bitch and they crawl off and die. Now I used to do that, you know, for like hours. And this is where hip hop comes from. The difference between what I'm doing and what hip hop artists do is this. What I'm doing is what is known as a folk tale. I think that hip hop is the most important form of popular music ever devised among uh, young people uh, in this country. Now, that don't mean I like all of them, you 
they're saying because there's different kinds of hip hop. Uh, gangster rappers, uh, I have uh, 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 very little use for them, except as an anthropological interest. When I say anthropological interest, that is an interest in listening to what they have to say so that they can learn about the environment out of which they come and how they perceive their existence. Anthropology, the study of man, right? Study of human culture. So I have an anthropological interest in, uh, in uh, gangster rap. And some of them are quite artful, you know? I mean, uh, but basically, the importance of hip hop is that it, first of all, it's an intellectual art, like comedy, okay? Uh, dancing, what have you, that's physical. Uh, hip hop is an intellectual art. That is, you have to sit down and think. You've got to think. You're creating narratives. You're creating narratives and rhymes. <laughs> now, of course, they didn't invent, even in terms of artifice, creating narratives and rhymes. Creating stories and rhymes uh, is very old. It goes all the way back to Moliere. Many of you ever heard of Moliere? Moliere was a great French playwright, contemporary William <laughs> Shakespeare. From that era. And if you go to the library or go online and look up a play called The Misanthrope, and you'll see that the whole play is written in line. Every line is written in line. Right? So telling dramatic stories in rhyme uh, is nothing new. And even telling stories in verse, because Shakespeare, all of Shakespeare is verse, all of Shakespeare's portraits, I am the pentameters, is an English, but it's, and it's not, and it doesn't rhyme, it's free for most part, but it was verse, it's me, it's that portrait, very high level portrait, as a matter of fact. So, when I talk about the fashion disaster that has befallen uh, young men as a result of the hip hop revolution, I'm talking particularly about that. Whatever virtues hip hop has, teaching y'all how to dress ain't one of them, right? Now, when I was coming up, <laughs> when I was coming up, uh, black men were, we set the, we were, well, y'all still set the fashion in black and Hispanic men, but y'all just set it in the wrong direction. Uh, but when I was coming up, we were looking at people like Nat King Cole, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, uh, Bill Eckstein. Do y'all know who any of these people are? Yeah. All right, well, these were the sharpest men in America. Everybody wanted to dress like them. You know, I heard one white guy say that he would die if he could be Duke Ellington for a day. He'd be ready to die, you know, people there. So they were the epitome of what it meant to be a male element. And of course, I'm the product of it. So you see what, what we were. And perhaps you can get some ideas about that. On the question of education and leadership, it is easy to see that our greatest leaders, beginning with Frederick Douglass, and Frederick Douglass was born a slave. He had no opportunity like you had. Frederick Douglass grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland where it was a capital offense to teach a slave to read. That is, if you got caught teaching a black person to read, you could lose your life. That's how serious they were about not wanting us to learn how to read. And why do you think that's so? Well, I'll tell you what Frederick Douglass found out about it. Well, first of all, how many of you know who Frederick Douglass was? All right, good. This is very gratifying to tell me your teacher's been doing the job, even though I don't understand why you don't know who Colin Whitson is I would have discussed about that because Colin Whitson is somebody who definitely bought the road. They said this is a guy who was, you know, Colin G. Whitson was a singular figure. There's no person in the history of America in this field who did none. You know what I'm saying? Singular voice. Okay, but Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, as I said, where he was, where he was kept in slavery, it was the capital of Pence to teach his slaves to read. But Douglass heard. Uh, uh, he would see the master pick up this book and read on it. And he thought that the book was talking to him. So when he would go to leave the room, he would go to listen. The book didn't say nothing to him. So he's wondering what is going on here, you know? So he began to find out that they were deciphering these symbols on the page. So Douglas used all kinds of means to learn how to read. One of the means he used was to trick the master's son into telling him. He would point to something and say, what is that? He said, so he said I bet you can't spell it. And they would spell it in the sand, and he copped another word. But one day, he found an old spell in the, the, the white folks had thrown away. And he was looking through it, and the slave master's wife caught him with it. And she became intrigued. Can a Negro really learn to read? You know what I mean? Can, you know what I mean? So she started teaching those. 
and the slave master caught her at it. And he said to her, what are you doing? Don't you know that education is unsuited to niggas for slavery? And Douglas heard him say that. So Douglas said, ah, education is the path to freedom. And it is. It was then, and it is now. 